So growing up in uh, rural Canada, there are many things, many beautiful things that you get to, uh, you get the opportunity to experience growing up in Canada at the time that I did. Uh, there was always some of the things I miss. There was always a street hockey game to be played. There was always somebody on the street, one of the kids, you know, that would pull the nets out and we, we would play until a car came by. And it was just uh, some of my, my best memories. There was always... I mean, multiple times over the course of my schooling in Canada, there were field trips done to maple syrup, maple syrup uh, processing plants. That was always great, all right? You never can get too much maple syrup. The best thing about the place that we would go is they would take the fresh maple syrup, and then we'd go on a day where there was a great, you know, a, a good snow day that day, which were many in Canada, and you would take the maple syrup, and you'd take a popsicle stick, and you scoop up some snow, and then you dump the maple syrup on the snow. Oh, so good, so good. Or maybe I'm remembering it as a 10-year-old as a kid. I don't know. But it was wonderful. It was wonderful. There were many great things, awesome things about growing up. One of the things, though, when I, so I came over for school to the United States, 18 years old, came to Chicago, so rural Canada and Chicago, totally different. One of the things that I, you know, many myriad things that you're not prepared for, you know, how to ride public transportation, you know, how to, you know, just navigate big city life, how to... Uh, move, uh, people on the sidewalks moved a lot quicker than we did back in Canada, okay? People were on a mission to get places. But one of the things that was my experience for the first time, coming to Moody, every student there had to have what the Moody students call the PCM, which was short for Practical Christian Ministry. And when you come in as a freshman, you don't get to pick. As you get up into the upper classes, you can kind of pick and choose, hey, this is where I'm going to do. You can find a local church and get plugged in and say, hey, I'm going to do my practical Christian ministry here. But when you go for the first time, they just assign you something. And I'll never forget getting my PCM at the first uh, class, the first kind of orientation that we were at. And all that it says was, was homeless ministry on Lower Wacker. Homeless ministry on Lower Wacker. And I... Didn't, you know, another thing you're not exposed to is, you know, and, and maybe many of you grew up similarly if you didn't grow up in the city, is, is you don't often experience, whether it's in suburban life or rural Canadian life, like I grew up in, you just, homelessness is, is not a thing that you experience. If someone was struggling financially or going through things, they would move back in with parents or they would go and, and you know, they would sell their house and downsize. Maybe that was the most extreme thing that we had the opportunity to experience when I was growing up. But that first time, I'll never forget what that did to shape something that we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to be looking at God's abundant compassion. And I don't know if I ever experienced compassion in a true way until I saw the things that I saw for, for a whole year on Lower Wacker. And going down there, you know, if you've been to the city, if you've been to this, this lower part of the city, there's, you know, basically this whole under the city road system and underneath there, because of the way Chicago is and, you know, can be hot in the summer and obviously extremely cold in the wintertime, is there was whole communities of people. You know, there were, what you, for lack of a better term, they were, there were almost houses that they had set up down there as a place to live and function and, 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 and be down there. And there was especially, there was a man named Brian that was down there that we would see every week. And I'll never forget the feeling that I had in my heart for Brian. As this, he was, you know, maybe in his late 20s, early 30s. And he was totally there mentally and emotionally and, and was, the most, was the most lucid person that I got the chance to talk to down on Lower Wacker. That didn't make him more or less deserving of compassion, but it definitely pulled on my heartstrings a little bit more to see this man who had fallen on difficult times didn't have family around to fall back on, didn't have something, anything, and in terms of help or things that he needed. And every week we would come and we'd, we'd gather our food, we would take these big boxes of food that was left over from the cafeteria and just deliver them out to these people. And every week we would talk, I would talk to Brian and get the opportunity to hear more of his story or more of his dreams, still had dreams of what he wanted to do and how he wanted to get out. And there's still times that I think about that man who had set up down there. I'll never forget, it was near the end of the year. It was after the winter was over. We were moving into springtime. We went down there, and periodically on Lower Wacker, the police would just clear out. They would go down there and clear the homeless out of that area. And after that, 
none of our normal people were there. I remember, I'll never forget that day because we didn't give out any of the boxes we brought because everybody was gone. I never saw Brian again. I don't know if he had the opportunity to rebound. I don't know if he ended up maybe worse than off than he was before. But I'll never forget that feeling in that moment, that feeling of compassion that I had never had before, but also a feeling of helplessness of like, God, what do I do here and how do I help and, and what's, what can be done sometimes? And just remembering and thinking about how I, I lived so much of my life even, not that, like I said, not that there's more or less deserving of compassion, but there was this part of my heart that in whether I acknowledged it or not, didn't always and still to this day have to work at sometimes working at exercising a compassionate part of my heart. Because you know, when you're compassionate about somebody, when true godly compassion takes over your heart, it hurts and it doesn't leave you. And you think about that person and you wonder how they're doing and you, and you, you pray more for that. It involves more of you. And you know what sometimes is easy f- us, easier for us to do, church, and I'm not accusing any of us of lack of compassion, but it is easier oftentimes to look at certain things and not to exercise the compassionate part of your heart because you think, man, if I, if I allow myself to start feeling that way for that person, that's going to take up a lot of space in my life. Because it does. It does. And you know, think about the beauty and the, and the wonderful things that I've experienced here as part of this church family is that when somebody is going through something difficult, we have people who are willing to exercise that compassionate part of their heart and say, no matter what, how busy my day is, I'm going to find time to pray for this person or I'm going to find time to give them a call to see how they're doing or I'm going to find time to make them a meal because I know that they're going through something and don't have time to do that for themselves. There's a part of our heart, that compassionate part, that takes work to really exercise and do it. And the reason that we can, the reason that we do, is because we see the example set in our own lives from God himself and his abundant compassion. He never, never is stingy with the compassionate part of who he is because he is fully and totally and completely compassionate for his people. And in that vein, the the idea, the key idea for us today is this, for those that seek it, God's compassion is immeasurable. For those that seek it, God's compassion is immeasurable. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 55, and I'll show you why this key idea is true. It says, come everyone who thirsts, in verse 1, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good and delight yourself with rich food. The first thing we see about God's compassion is that God's compassion is for the undeserving. God's compassion is for the undeserving. And praise the Lord for that, because I am an undeserving person. Praise the Lord, because this church is filled with undeserving people. We do not deserve the compassion of God. And yet he gives it. Look what it says. It says, come drink, those who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Without money and without price. We don't have anything to bring, church. We are poor. We are the ones that are poor. In spirit and in our own hearts, we are the poorest people, and we come to God, and he says, you don't have anything, you don't have any money, you don't have any ability to do anything, you don't have any of these things, that doesn't matter, come and buy and drink and experience anyway. Come and take anyway. We are undeserving, and we have nothing, and yet God says, that doesn't matter, take anyway, take it anyway. 
And this is where, church, often God's compassion differs from the compassion that we often have in our hearts. Because oftentimes, the compassion of human beings, I know the compassion of my own heart sometimes, is dependent on whether I think you're worthy of it or not. On whether I think you deserve it or not. Whether I thought it or not, the reason oftentimes I felt maybe more compassion for Brian on Lower Wacker is hearing his story and hearing, man, he tried to work hard. He tried to do all the right things, and yet he still ended up here. That's not fair, and so I feel compassion for him. Is it as easy to feel compassion for the person who maybe ended up there because they chose that path, because they chose to give their money and life to drugs, or maybe because they chose, are they any less deserving of compassion? In, in my own eyes, I confess, oftentimes it's easier to say, yeah, Brian is more deserving than this person over here. That's not how God's compassion works. All of us are undeserving, and so all of us need the compassion of God. Do you understand when you look at someone and say, I don't, I don't want to have compassion on that person because they don't, I don't think they deserve it. I don't think they've done what is necessary to deserve my compassion. That what would happen in your life if God looked at you that way? If God looked at you the same way and said, well, Sam, you, you, didn't, you didn't come to me. I gave you every opportunity. Sam, I gave you a Christian family. I gave you, you know, a great home. I, great, I gave you everything you ever needed. And you still wouldn't have chosen to come to me. So do you deserve it? No, Lord, I didn't. And yet he gave it to me anyway. I am the most undeserving. And yet God gives. We need to be careful that our compassion isn't based off of who we think deserves it or not. Because that is a shallow and not a godly compassion. He says, all come. He asked them, why do you spend your money on that which is not bread or labor for that which does not satisfy? He's showing them, look, you think sometimes, and this is easy for us to do as Christians, you think you have money to spend. You know how we think we become more deserving of God's love? is by doing good things. How many people do you think if you were to ask, do you think God loves you, would say, yes, because I try to do what is good and because I try to go to church and because I try to say the right things and raise my kids the right way and put my money to charity, they would say, look, that's how I'm spending my money. And God is saying, look, that, that doesn't buy you the compassion and grace and love of Jesus Christ. You're spending your money on things do, that do not satisfy on that which is not bread. The only way you can spend and get what is good is actually the opposite of what we think. It's actually by coming, saying, I have nothing, Lord. I have nothing to give. I don't have money to spend. I am in desperate need of you and you alone. The more undeserving we are, the more undeserving we recognize we are, the more we get to experience and drink and abide in the fullness of God's compassion for us. The only responsibility we have is laid out for us in verse 6. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. There is church, even though we were all undeserving, we are all undeserving of the compassion of God. There is still this balance of the one responsibility we are given is to come to God, is to come to God, is to seek him and say, God, I'm going to turn from my ways. I am going to say no more to my unrighteous thoughts. Our one responsibility is to say, God has abundant compassion for you, but you have to go to him. There are so many people out there that God is trying to give his compassion to. He's trying to lavish his compassion on them. And yet all they know, all they would need to do is turn and say, God, I accept it. Thank you for that compassion that you've given to me. And yet they refuse to turn to him. They refuse to leave their wicked ways. They refuse to seek God. All that is asked is that we seek the God of compassion that he has for us. 
to turn to him, and he will lavish it upon us. There is that responsibility for us to seek and to turn to him. The next thing that we see about God's compassion in verses 7 and 8 is not just that God's compassion is for, for the undeserving, but God's compassion is beyond understanding. Look at what these say. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts in verse 7. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is telling us that even when it comes to compassion, we may not even be able to understand the depths of the compassion that he has for us. Because not only in our human compassion, right, our human compassion is not always just based on who deserves it and who doesn't, it's also based on do you respond the right way when I show you compassion? Do you do what I expect you to do when I express that compassion towards you? Because what we expect is that when we show compassion to somebody, they immediately, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. They're so appreciative for it. They're so thankful for it. They're amazed by it. They say, thank you for being compassionate to me, even if maybe I didn't deserve it. But if our compassion is not met with the right response, there is a certain point, I think for all of us, where we feel like our compassion has limits where our compassion runs out for somebody. I know that the disciples thought this way. In Matthew chapter 18, Peter asked the Lord, he says, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? You see, for Peter, that was his measure. That was as far as his compassion went. Lord, seven times? I think I could do seven, God. I think seven times, that's fair. If I forgive them seven times and they, don't, and, and they don't respond, I think that's as far as my compassion should go, Lord. Jesus responds, I tell you, not as many as seven, but 70 times seven. Peter, take that number and times it by 70. Take that beyond what you could ever think, Peter. Your compassion should not have the limits you think you should put on it. Your compassion should not stop at the place you think it should stop because my ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. I don't know about you, but for God's compassion in my life, I've used up my seven times. I've used up my 70 times seven times. And yet God's compassion comes back. And yet God's compassion is always there. If I would just but turn to him, his compassion is waiting there for me. Church, our compassion not only is just who deserves it or who doesn't, it's not one that has limitations that we can conjure up. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so even though it doesn't make sense, but God, it's not fair. I've shown compassion plenty of times, and they're not doing anything differently, God. They're not changing anything. Nothing's different, God. What do you, what do you, make, what do you expect me to do? Forgive them again? Yes, that's what I expect you to do because that's what I do for you every time. That's the level of compassion and forgiveness that God expects from us, church. And does it make sense? No. To the world, oftentimes, does it look like, hey, man, you're, you're getting taken advantage of. Maybe. I may be getting taken advantage of here on earth, but I know in heaven there is something greater waiting for me than whatever is being taken from me here. That's what the compassion of God looks like. When you get to a place where you're like, God, I don't understand this anymore. I don't understand what's going on. I don't know what you would have me to do. God's saying, good, now you're getting a fractionally close to where my compassion is for you. Now you're maybe starting to scratch the surface. His compassion is beyond understanding. And the last thing, God's compassion leads to change. Look in verse 10. It says, for as the rain and the snow come down from the heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, 
so shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's compassion, God's word, as it leaves his mouth like the rain and the snow that fall down to the earth, that it doesn't just come down and then bounce back up to him. It comes down and it accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. It accomplishes the plan for which he had it to do. You know, this prayer, this is, this is a prayer that I pray weekly. I ask the Lord every single week because when I get up here to preach, I want to be preaching the very words of God and not my own, not my own thoughts, not my own desires, not what I want to say. I want to say what God has to say. And so when I do that, I say, God, I claim the promise that whether I hear about it or not, whether anyone pats me on the back and says, great sermon, whether anyone comes and tells me, hey, that was really good, thank you, whether, anybody, whether, whether I hear anything from anybody, I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the, words Lord, the, the, the Lord's word does not return empty. It accomplishes its purpose every time. When you show compassion to another person, you may not get a pat on the back. You may not get a way to go, thank you, you changed my life forever. I don't know. I don't know where Brian from Lower Wacker is. His life may have never turned around. He may have, I hope not, he may have, you know, gone to meet Jesus sooner than expected. I don't know. I don't know what happened for him. I may never hear about it. But I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I can be confident that God used my compassion. It's not a bragging. It's just God used me in some small way because we were just willing to say, hey, here's some food, and can we pray for you, and can we talk with you? Church, I'm not telling you that you're going to get all the notoriety, that you're going to get all the praise and honor and glory for the compassion that you show. What I'm promising you is the word of God tells you it does not return empty. When you speak with the words of God from the Bible, when you speak and live out the truths that are in here, it is not for nothing. God is at work even in the smallest things that you do, even in the ways that you may not notice. God is at work when you show his compassion to people in your lives. It leads to change every single time. That is not something that our human understanding of compassion can ever do. It cannot lead to lasting change. Only God's compassion does that. I love this last example of God's compassion in one chapter over Isaiah 56. This is how God's love and compassion extends even beyond the people he's talking to in this passage. He says in Isaiah 56, verse 3, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that cannot be cut off. God, from the beginning of his word, of his time with his people, is saying, look, my compassion, even though this whole book is focused on the people of Israel and the people of Judah, he's saying here in this passage, look, my compassion and my love extends even beyond my people to the people of the world. It extends to the foreigner and to the eunuch, people who the Jewish and, you know, the Jewish people at the time would have looked at them and said, you know, they are not of us and so they can't be with us. And God says, no, if they are following me and separate themselves from my purposes, they can come into my house and be in better status than even a son and a daughter. I will give them an everlasting name that cannot be cut off if they are willing to come and to follow me. And church is a lesson for us to remember that the compassion of God extends outside the walls of these church. The compassion of God extends even to those who we do not like and maybe we do not agree with. 
that God is desiring that those people, even that are currently turning and not accepting the compassion that he has for them, that doesn't lessen the fact that the compassion is still there. And his desire is to still see them return to him and be enveloped in the abundant, amazing compassion of God. There is no one too far, too gone, too sinful that they are outside the compassion of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Man, the compassion and mercy of God is so incredible. And so for us, what can we do with that? What can we do with that compassion of God? If there's an action for us to take, ask God this week to give you his compassion. How would your actions change if you saw your friends, your family, your coworkers, and your enemies with the compassionate heart of God? How would your life look differently if you asked God to say, give me a heart of compassion that's even beyond my understanding? If there's a prayer to pray, Lord, please help me not to take advantage of your compassion. May I display compassion in the same measure that it has been given to me. How we have that love and compassionate heart is remembering the same way that that compassion has been displayed to us. And then finally, if there's a praise to repeat. Thank you, thank you, Lord, that even though I am undeserving, you poured out your compassion on me. Church, the compassion of God has the power, the ability to change hearts and lives and to change people. Don't get stuck in thinking your compassion is enough or that it's about who des who's deserving or who's not or that it's about how much you can give versus when you have to stop. The compassion of God makes no sense. I, I desire to be a pastor and I desire us to be a church that makes no sense. I want us to seem a little weird, a little crazy, as long as it means we're weirdly and crazily compassionate for the people of this world and our own brothers and sisters here in this church.